Uh, good, after, good afternoon to others. My name is Chris Blattman. I'm a professor at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, and I'm pleased to have uh, four fabulous panelists here with me today. Uh, the first is Elizabeth Spahar, who's the Assistant Secretary General for Peace Building Support at the United Nations. Uh, the second is Mary Calder, uh, the Professor of Global Governance and Director of the Conflict and Civil Society Research Unit at the London School of Economics. We also have Stefano Tomat, Director of the Integrated Approach for Security and Peace at the European External Action Service. And finally, Odette Gonzalez Carrillo from Innovations for Poverty Action in Mexico. Uh, we're going to begin uh, with about half our time. I have a question uh, for each, and they'll, they'll each offer uh, some remarks. And that'll be followed by Q&A from you. Uh, and so I'll remind you now to place questions in the chat. I'll, I'll remind you again later, but you can feel free to start putting in questions as we go. Uh, and we'll select from those uh, in the second half of our session. So Elizabeth, uh, let me start with you. Um, so where do you see the role of of peace building in, in this sort of nexus between development and security? And like, how should we think about peace building's past contribution uh, and, and its possible future contributions? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. And uh, I wanna thank the, the organizers for inviting me to this panel with really a, a, a terrific uh, group of co-panelists. Um, Look, in terms of, uh, of peace building and where we are, I think we have to state from the outset that we're in particularly challenging times. And I'm, I'm not just talking about the, um, the terrible conflict in Ukraine, which, which, of which uh, we are all definitely seized. Uh, but in addition to that, if you look at what's happening around the world, we have um, a compounding of, 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 of crises. And in particular, this is the case in, in uh, fragile and conflict uh, affected um, countries or regions. So at the same time as you've got, shall I say, the traditional security and, um, and development challenges, you have another layer of additional challenges that are, are coming on stream, let's say newer challenges. Another obvious one is the COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, even though in, in some parts of the world we, we're, we're having this perhaps foolish feeling that we're, we're almost out of the woods on, on COVID, uh, it's continuing to ravage uh, many, many other countries and particularly conflict affected fragile countries um, where vaccinations tend to be very, very low. Um, they're having a much harder time to pull out of, 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 uh, of the, um, the height of the, of the pandemic. You can add also other issues such as uh, cyber crime, cyber warfare, just to name a few. So um, we, we not only have we not managed to um, uh, to, to really figure out best how to handle the, let's say, the old traditional problems, but now we have a whole host of, of, of new problems. And in terms of where um, peace building comes in, and I think that, um, and you were talking about development and security in, in particular. I mean, first of all, I think in a way, uh, in uh, fragile and conflict affected uh, places, it's, it's sort of a false dichotomy, because if you ask uh, you know, a farmer sort of what's more important to development or, or security or, or what is the difference between development and security, I dare say that in his or her um, ordinary day-to-day -day lives, it's, it's sort of the same thing. Uh, if you don't have a basic sense of security, you, you can't, um, you know, use the road uh, out, out of the village to go and sell your produ uh, uh, produce. If you don't have uh, development, uh, that can feed in as a conflict driver into insecurity. So there's really in a way, no daylight between those uh, in that sense. Um, and I think maybe it's more we, the so-called practitioners and the academics that somehow have a problem of you know, development versus security and, and so on. And peace building for me, uh, I think the, 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 the most important thing about it is that we're talking about a holistic concept. So we are looking, first of all, at trying to have a good analysis of what the conflict drivers are in any given context and to make those interconnections. Um, and once we've we've gotten the data, we've analyzed. Then I think we can we can adequately work together to see how we tackle uh, tackle these issues. And so I would say that in terms of, of peace building, you have um, a number of things that you can let's say the peace building uh, concept and uh, as we call it in the UN the architecture um, brings brings to the the, the table. So in addition to this sort of holistic um, approach, um, we also have, um, I think, a great uh, opportunity to build coherence on that basis. 
And I say that because, um, you know, the UN has its, its key pillars that we always talk about, human rights, development, and peace and security. And the vision for some time in the UN has been one UN and making sure those threads are all pulled together in order to have, again, a holistic solution on, on the ground. Uh, but it's always been easier said than, than done. And I think we now have some peace building instruments that, that that help us to bring that to bear um, much more uh, much more effectively. Um, secondly, in relation to that, I think um, working on the peace building uh, sort of ethos, uh, concept or in the peace building ethos allows us to work more effectively with other partners, such as the World Bank, um, other IFIs, but certainly uh, and very importantly with governments and and civil society. And in terms of the way that uh, the UN approaches peace building. This is something that is is absolutely built on the foundation of national ownership. So it's not that we are um, at all running around doing things that a government uh, is not fully aware of and, and not fully supportive of, but not just the government. It's a question of bringing in uh, also um, uh, other actors and certainly civil society. And, and here's another point, uh, and it's not exclusive to peace building, but I have to say that the work that we do in peace building is absolutely predicated on the idea of inclusion. So in terms, again, of the, if you will, the development security uh, nexus, the idea is also to ensure that um, we, are, we are being inclusive and making sure that women are fully involved, young people are fully involved, but also the traditionally marginalized populations, rural populations, um, the, the, the extreme poor, um, and, uh, and so forth. And, and I think... Um, Maybe a couple of other points on, on peace building. You know, the, the notion of peace building as it was laid out in the UN in, um, in the two sets of twin resolutions um, through our bodies. So both the General Assembly and the Security Council twice um, upheld the importance of, of peace building and sustaining peace. And the major point that they were making is that um, first of all, uh, at the root of everything is 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 prevention. We we have to try to prevent because it's it's far more costly um, to uh, to rebuild, or it's it's far more difficult to stop a conflict once it's it's started, and that obviously has huge implications for uh, for development. In fact, the um, Pathways for Peace uh, report that came out it was a joint UN World Bank report of not too long ago. Um, gave very clear evidence of, of the clear link between conflict and inequalities, for example. Um, and so what they were saying is we need to privilege uh, prevention and we need to invest more in prevention and peace building. And peace building as a concept is furthermore uh, supposed to be a, a, a way of working, as we call it, across the peace continuum. So it, it's, it's uh, you know, main objective is going to be to try to, to prevent upfront but also it should be an available tool across a, a peace cycle. So not only helping or trying to prevent an outbreak of, of violent conflict, also trying to stem escalation, uh, continuation and recurrence of conflict. Um, so I think that's a very important uh, concept to, to, to build on. And in terms of the way we're trying to, to work on peace building, particularly through the peace building uh, fund, is again in concert very much with our, our partners across the system and beyond, both at the global level, but very much and most importantly at the, uh, at the field level. And for that, we rely on our UN country teams through our resident coordinators, through our, our, um, our peace missions as well. And we try to uh, position the, the role of, of our peace building efforts um, as, we, as we call it, um, as, as timely, catalytic, and risk-tolerant uh, approaches to, to the problem at hand. So timely in the sense that we're, we're trying to, to, and we do have uh, funds that, are, that are, are quite flexible and quite um, rapid to be, um, to be utilized. Uh, catalytic in the sense that often not only do they bring different um, agencies and actors uh, together, but they can also help to um, if you will, orient larger pots of money to the to the problem at hand and risk tolerant in the sense that um, we are, uh, through the peace building ethos, we're ready to go in to certain uh, situations uh, rather quickly that that other organizations might might not be able to or, or other parts of the system may not be able to as as um, um, as, as rapidly. And in terms of the you were talking about building on the, the, the successes or what we have learned. Uh, from 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 the past, I mean, uh, again, I think a number of things. Um, 
one of one of the important things I think is is to support local peace builders. Um, so we really need to get um, both political support, uh, advocacy, and resources to um, direct individuals that are working on the ground. Again, particularly trying to get more support for youth who are doing um, many very courageous and important things in uh, in conflict affected and, and fragile um, uh, contexts. Uh, I think we, we need to um, learn much better. You were talking about the past from our experiences. So we've really been trying to beef up our, our monitoring and evaluation of what we do, what the impact is um, and what we can do better in, in future. And that very much involves, um, again, the people on the ground, the direct actors and the beneficiaries. And we are trying to both promote and we're preparing a guidance on this idea of community-based um, evaluations. And thirdly, as, as I've been sort of insisting all along, um, we really need to build on partnerships. Uh, I don't think we can go it alone. We all have distinct mandates. That's very clear. Um, but again, what we have seen is that you, you cannot really um, create sustained uh, change without really going across that, that spectrum of, of security, development, human rights, institution building, um, political and social considerations such as supporting the implementation of peace uh, agreements, supporting reconciliation. It, it all has to, to somehow come together. So we all have different tools that we can bring to bear. Um, and when we are, um, we're working in, in silos, um, frankly, it doesn't, it doesn't have the, um, the same effect. So one of the things that encourages me, uh, let's say in our relationship with um, the World Bank, which is, which is hosting this event, is that we have more and more um, been working together at, at the get-go, trying to um, gather data, share the data that we have of what's going on on the ground, and then doing joint uh, analysis and assessments. And I think if we have that baseline approach where we're all starting from the same understanding, of what are the conflict drivers in this particular context? Um, and then how can we strategize to see what is the best approach? Um, then I think we have the best possibility to be able to work well on the ground together. And we've also done that um, in tandem, uh, by the way, with, with the uh, EU. So we've done with EU and World Bank, several uh, joint recovery and peace building assessments um, in places like Mozambique and, and Libya. We're in the process of, of working on that. Um, and again, I'm hoping that that will lead us to better align our efforts um, on the ground. So let me just stop there for now and a um, bit of food for thought and would look forward to um, further conversation, hearing further panelists uh, and, uh, and the questions, unless you have more questions right now for me, Chris, over. Great, thank you. No, I, think, I think it's a great idea to, uh, to I, I'm gonna have to ask you to mute Elizabeth. Um, to sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Um, no, this is let's let's go through each of the candidates and uh, the, the the panelists, and then we'll we'll open it up and have some discussion. Um, so so Mary, I'll, I'll go to you next. Uh, so famously, now I think twenty five years ago, you characterized um, new wars to describe conflicts in the post Cold War era. And so my question is, you know, what's new about new wars? Uh, in particular, like how do you think see the relationship between uh, security and development and responding to them in the next 25 years, uh, especially given, uh, you know, recent events in Ukraine? Yeah, thank you for the question and thank you for inviting me to be on this forum. Um, I think what I call new wars, which I contrast with old wars, and I'll say a little bit about old wars in a minute, uh, are really what we now call protracted conflicts or forever wars. And I think they are actually the opposite of development. I think the way to understand them is as a kind of social system or a social condition. And, it, you know, it's a social system like capitalism or communism. It's a way of organizing society. And the way you do it is that you have numerous armed groups who are both state and non-state but who benefit from violence itself rather than from winning or losing. So they benefit economically from loot, pillage, smuggling, setting up checkpoints. All of these things bring them revenue, uh, which gives them an incentive to continue the violence. They also 
I don't know whether you'd say benefit, but they also contribute to per ethnic or religious polarization. They're very often identified with exclusivist ethnic or religious types of identity politics and the situation of fear brings them supporters and polarizes society. And so these continue for years and years and years and they're terribly difficult to end. And I, I, I like a lot of what Elizabeth said about the importance of finding local areas where people try to opt out of this situation. Um, but they, these are very different from what I call old wars. And, and what I mean by old wars are both wars between states, but also classic civil wars, which were wars between two sides, which were deep-rooted political contests. And we know from Clausewitz that those wars had a tendency to become extreme. New wars have a tendency to persistence. They go on forever. <clears throat> the old wars, each side tries to win. And as Klaus Fitz put it, the generals try to disarm the opponents. The political politicians try to impose their will. And hatred and fear is mobilized among the people. These wars were very, very destructive, hugely destructive. But they were also, to some extent, and in some cases, state building, or even contributed to development because each side had to mobilize the whole population. It had to raise taxes. It had to organize the state efficiently. It had to organize food and industry in order to prosecute the war. And so you do see big jumps in major wars. Um, and if we're thinking about Ukraine, I think, for the moment, Ukraine is actually an old war, not a new war. <laughs> it's between two states, and the Ukrainian state particularly is mobilizing everybody for the war effort. Um, but I think there is a huge risk in this situation, because nowadays, going to the extreme could mean the use of nuclear weapons. It's very dangerous to go to the extreme. And so if neither side is able to actually win, there's a huge danger that this war would turn itself into a new war. And how might it turn itself into a new war? Well, I think, first of all, economic. If the central funding for soldiers runs out, the soldiers start funding themselves through loot. And actually, Russian soldiers are already looting some places to make money. Uh, we saw in the early stages of the Chechen war, the generals were trading in oil with Chechen warlords in order to pay the wages of their soldiers. So that's the situation that tends to lead to the formation of armed groups who are kind of self-financing. And the other aspect of it is, could this lead to the ethnicization of the war? Of course, Putin's already presenting it in ethnic terms. He's talking about the Ukrainian Russians and how they're really Russian. But actually, Ukraine itself is very much a civic concept. Uh, it brings Ukrainians and Russians together. President Zelensky is actually Russian and Jewish. Uh, he's a born Russian speaker. But how long can that civic sense last when terrible things are happening to people? <laughs> uh, when terrible things are happening to people, will Ukrainians start blaming ethnic Russians? Will it start leading to ethnic cleansing? And then there's a final concern I have, which is about the blanket nature of the sanctions. I think it was great that the world reacted so immediately the way it did, and it sent a very strong signal to Putin that we're not prepared to accept this kind of behavior in a way that we didn't do after, for instance, the annexation of Crimea. Uh, but at the same time, the problem with the sanctions is that while some aspects of the sanctions are very important, like reining in corrupt money, uh, targeting the Russian oligarchs, like 
trying to impose sanctions on oil and gas, which actually is very important, not only for the revenue of the Russian state, but also for climate change, actually. Um, but there are other things like MasterCards and Visa cards, sport and culture that affect ordinary Russians and that will make it very hard for ordinary Russians to live. And that's the kind of thing that can lead to the sort of fragmentation of society if Putin stays in power. I think it could be very similar to Venezuela. And the idea of a sort of fragmented, fragile state like Venezuela with 5,000 nuclear weapons is quite alarming. So the question is, should, if we think in these terms, what does it imply for strategy? First of all, it implies that we should provide a lot of cash to the Ukrainian government and make sure they can continue to pay their soldiers. I think that's more important than sending weapons. Secondly, it's terribly important to continue promoting this civic notion. And I think it's incredibly important that we take very, very seriously the Russian opposition. Uh, Russians have been protesting in the streets in 53 cities and they're threatened with being imprisoned for 15 years for those kinds of protests. We've got to support them. And we also need to be very friendly towards any Russians who want to, Russian soldiers who want to seek asylum uh, or to leave. We should be doing that, a lot of that. Um, and uh, I think also everything Elizabeth has said about local peace building is incredibly important in all these situations. There are always towns that are committed to civic behavior, that do want to keep, you always find them in all the wars I've ever studied. And those towns need to be supported. Uh, it would be great, by the way, to have a UN presence in Ukraine, and we might want to discuss how we could do that. Um, and then finally, I think we need a much more differentiated approach to sanctions, at least in the long term. It's all right for now. But if this goes on, we need to be able to think of ways linked to conditionality to lift at least the sanctions on ordinary people. I'm thinking of ceasefires, humanitarian corridors, uh, weakening repression on people inside Russia. So I focused very much on Ukraine, but I hope it illustrates what I mean, because I think new wars are the real disaster. And if we have a global spread of new wars, what we'll see is far from development, the, if you like, development backwards, un, you know, undoing development is what we'll see. And that's really dangerous. And I, again, so much agree with Elizabeth about all of our global challenges require us to think in comprehensive ways about peace building. Um, in the, you know, the extraordinary thing is that WHO announced the end of uh, polio in 1986, I think. And yet polio has reappeared in Afghanistan and the Congo and will never deal with pandemics unless we deal with conflict or with climate change. Great, thank you so much. So Stefano, um, Mary just mentioned comprehensive approaches to peace building. Uh, so I wanna ask you to, to talk a bit about that because the EU advocates for, uh, consistently advocates for comprehensive approach to conflicts and crises. And so tell us a little bit about that um, and maybe reflect on the main lessons, both the successes and challenges, if you will. Yes, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon from Brussels. Uh, and thanks also to, to the World Bank for uh, the opportunity to participate in this important uh, panel. Um, I would say that the European Union has been reflecting on what you mentioned, the comprehensive approach or integrated approach for quite some time. Uh, in in order to find a way to deal with crises that, as Mary just said, are getting uh, more complex and uh, diverse. Actually, the reflection on new wars was one of the elements that helped us uh, in reflecting on our new approach and uh, also the work that was done uh, on the peace building side by the United Nations is another element that provided good elements of reflection for, uh, for our uh, work. 
So what did we do? Um, the first step for us has been to set up a political framework meaning to have a political element that would uh, provide us the, the main analysis of where we want to go. And this has been the EU Global Strategy of 2016, where uh, the European Union concluded that we need to use all our instruments in order to tackle the crisis of today. The, the new wars need to have all our instruments, and so to use uh, the full spectrum from security, military, uh, conflict prevention, financial aspects. You see, for example, the role of sanctions are playing now in the conflict that is happening in Ukraine, but also development and all the aspects that uh, Elizabeth mentioned as part of the peace building uh, approach. Um, another document that for us has been essential is the European Consensus of, on Development, which basically makes clear how state building and development are closely connected. And we have to work in order to ensure that the, the development uh, helps the state building, but also the state building is necessary in order to ensure the development of a, of a country. The third element that I would like to mention is the EU Integrated Approach document of 2017, where basically we decided that all, uh, all our policies need to look at the comprehensive picture. The big picture is how we should address uh, the uh, crisis of today. And when I say the big picture, for us the, in the big picture, there are not only the European Union institution, but also its member states and also the international partners. The UN in premise, but uh, for example, also the World Bank. It was mentioned that, uh, for example, the work that we have done on RPBAs in several parts of the world with the World Bank. That's a certainly another aspect. So the um, integrating the tools for us has meant to develop some specific ones and uh, to reinforce others. When I say develop specific ones, for example, I look at preventing conflict. Now we have an early warning system, which is a tool that looks at all the different data that are available for each single country in the world. And based on that, we look ahead the next four years, how a country is going to evolve and what are the risks for this country to be in crisis and then in conflict. Based on that, we adjust our policies and we try to make sure that uh, uh, we can address the drivers of conflict and the drivers of risk. We have developed concepts, uh, concepts that go from, uh, I don't know, uh, the impact of climate change on, on security and development, but also SSR. We have just finished now a new work together with the United Nations uh, uh, office on DDR, for example, which is a concept that I'm very much attached because I think it's really important to ensure stabilization in the long term. And the third element of our conceptual uh, work has been on an ad adapting the new crisis. The impact of uh, health issues, obviously co uh, coronavirus was uh, a clear uh, trigger for that reflection. But I also would like to mention, for example, hybrid threats on which we have done a lot, a lot of work that now is becoming very useful in the context of Ukraine, where a lot of hybrid uh, and disinformation are going on, uh, and many others. Second step of our integrated approach uh, after the conceptual part is uh, um, the issue of... Uh, no putting together structural arrangements. This means to change the structures of the European Union. We have created a directorate, which is the directorate I'm responsible for, which is a directorate that is meant to ensure the integrated approach. So the responsibility of designing the plan, the big plan where you put together conflict prevention and military intervention, where you put together mediation and uh, consular uh, protection. So the plan is a united plan. The second element is the funding. I think uh, Elizabeth was also mentioning the importance of funding. Uh, we have now one single fund, which is called DICI, for the whole European Union and uh, obviously for the Commission, the European Commission, 
which is providing uh, all the funds on the basis of a thorough analysis, including conflict analysis on a major intervention. So it's a one single fund for all the different actions, which goes from peace to stability to conflict prevention. Third element uh, of our uh, structural change is uh, the, um, the use of our delegation. The European Union has a major uh, network of EU delegations around the world, which are, in, I would say, a natural tool of uh, integrated approach because it's one place where the European Union gets united and can ensure the implementation of our work at the national level. Uh, fourth element that I would like to, to mention at this point is also a new tool that we have designed, which is called the European Peace Facility, which provides uh, um, help, help in terms of capabilities and materials to all our partners. Uh, material that can be also military, and so we have a strong capacity to support partners on the military and the security aspects as well. Uh, the first step that I would like to mention, and you asked me for concrete examples, uh, is uh, the capacity to plan. I was mentioning that, uh, in my first point that uh, we have now a capacity to have a single plan. And I'll give you the example of Mozambique, uh, because I think it's a good example of how we work. First of all, we have uh, developed a concept that we call a Policy Framework for Comprehensive Approach, EFCA, where we design a plan where all the different instruments are taken together in one single document. So everybody knows what they have to do from humanitarian to development, from military to stabilization. And second element that brings everybody together is a conflict analysis. So we have the PSCA and a conflict analysis that are at the base of our action. Based on this, we deploy the different tools. Humanitarian, we support peace building either by the region, by the UN, or we do it directly. We support the conflict uh, prevention uh, dialogue and interfaith dialogue with the uh, different NGOs that are supported by us directly. Obviously, we have developed, deployed, as you know, a military operation as well that is uh, helping the Mozambican army to regain control of uh, the Capo Delgado area. And we provide equipment to those uh, military components that are trained by us. At the same time, we don't provide only equipment. We could provide also, for example, um, uh, courses on uh, human rights. We provide them uh, uh, training on how to ensure appropriate uh, dealing with the uh, local uh, population. And uh, finally, we also look at how to work with our partners. I'm thinking, for example, uh, the work that we are doing with the SADC, but also with uh, the World Bank that uh, was mentioned before and the, and the UN. Um, final step that I would like to mention, and it was in your question, what we have learned. Well, now this is an oxymoron, but uh, first of all, we have learned that we need to learn in the sense that it's good to have lessons learned. Uh, I, I worked in plenty of institutions where there is a lot of lessons learned. But always it comes out the refrain, lessons learned, but then uh, is not implemented or it's difficult to implement. So what we have done uh, here is instead to set up a knowledge management system. So we learn the lessons, step one, but in the same unit, we have the training and then we have the concepts. So it's one single unit inside the EU that learns the lessons impact these lessons on the training that we provide to our officials and then also is responsible for the development of the development of concepts so that we change our concepts because we have learned the lessons and we change how our officials are working because they're trained based on the lessons that we have learned so is a is a triangular uh, work that we're doing and it's all in one single uh, unit the second uh, aspect that uh, for us is important uh, is uh, in, in learning 
is that uh, security gains are not uh, stable per se. They need uh, reforms. They need reforms in the rule of law, for example. They need reforms in the way the security forces behave, but also in how the population is associated to the results. There must be peace dividends somewhere, somehow. Otherwise, the population is uh, not uh, feeling that there are there is a change in uh, the conflict side, and so the violence will relapse. I mentioned this, for example, because it's something in my view where we could do more uh, in the Sahel, where the situation is really difficult, and uh, to give the population the possibility to see the peace dividends would be something that would make the difference in that context. The third uh, element of learning that I would like to mention is that uh, without a minimum level of security, uh, peace uh, is difficult and development is even more difficult. And so the two things go hand in hand. We need to ensure security, but we need to have uh, development and vice versa. Um, it's not easy because, for example, the tempo is not the same, at least for the European Union. We can achieve security in a medium, uh, short, medium time frame, but development requires a lot of time. So our investment in security has to be on the longer term because otherwise the development cannot kick in. So you have really to also look at the tempo of the different uh, tools in order to ensure that you have positive results. Well, this is a bit how concretely we're trying to do the integrated approach and how concretely we're trying to find the solution to the different crises we are involved. It's not easy. Uh, I'm not telling you that we have 100% successes, it would be false, but I have to say that we see improvements in how we are uh, tackling crises. We see that we are getting the first positive feedback on some situation. And uh, I think uh, that this is the way we will continue in order to ensure that uh, uh, we move uh, from a situation where uh, we, how to say, we intervene with one tool, hoping that is the fixer, and we move to, a, to an approach that is more, more uh, interpillar, trying to ensure that the whole capacity of the European Union is deployed in every single uh, crisis uh, situation. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so finally, Odette, you work in a very different context. Of course, you're you're in Mexico and, and you work in Central America, where the key violent, where the key, the key problem is is different. It's it's criminal violence. It's also conflict between not between states and not between states and a insurgent group, but rather uh, between the state and a collection of gangs and syndicates. And so, you know, how do you look at this situation? The role for development actors and whether or not development's a priority in that kind of environment. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, the World Bank, and everyone joining us today. Um, as we know, human security in its broadest sense embraces more than the absence of conflict. In all, it also encompasses human rights, good governance, access to education, healthcare, uh, and ensuring that each individual has opportunities to reach their own potential. Um, human development and human security are interconnected, but they are not the same. Human development is a broad concept aiming at en enlarging people's choices and freedoms, and human security is about assuring that people can exercise choices safely and freely and can be confident that the opportunities they have are protected. If we take a less broad definition of security, such as the absence of uh, conflict, uh, the connection between security and development persists. For instance, uh, conflict definitely affects variables like economic growth, exports, consumptions per capita, government revenue, and even climate change. Uh, on the other hand, the lack of uh, development or imbalanced development that involves income inequality and youth marginalization can be a cause of conflict. Also, institutions that are not strong, uh, it's not likely that they will be able to resist the, contact, the contact, constant challenges for criminal organizations and other security threats uh, that constantly attempt to corrupt 
infiltrate and intimidate these institutions. Um, and finally, security forms an important part of uh, communities' well-being and is therefore an objective of development. People's sense of well-being might be seriously affected with high levels of insecurity, for instance, injury or death as a result of a criminal or political violence, uh, forced migrations, and of course, uh, fear. Uh, so in the long run, it's impossible to achieve development without addressing human security, since human security is an intrinsic aspect of development. And at the same time, it is very unlikely to achieve security without addressing development issues. Um, thinking about public policy, it is possible and desirable to pursue uh, both development and security strategi strategies at the same time, instead of pursuing one and sacrificing uh, the other. And if we combine both, the result can be exceptional. Uh, for instance, there are some examples of successful law enforcement strategies that include components of uh, development. Uh, however, these strategies should be very well targeted since it is not very likely that a strategy aimed at improving educational or health, or health outcomes by itself uh, will improve security automatically and vice versa. So we have to identify the outcomes we want and quantify the important, uh, the, quantify the impact toward those uh, specific outcomes. Um, about the, the role of development actors in, in this type of uh, context, uh, so development actors can support governance and institution building in several ways, but a crucial one is by generating evidence or support the generation of evidence and inform public policy actors on what strategies work, but also by supporting institutional capacity and make sure that people and institutions that design and implement those programs and policies base their decision on evidence. Another decision element that is very related is the evaluation of programs programs and um, policies, and this one is often very underestimated. And I'm talking about impact evaluation that goes beyond uh, monitoring and evaluation of processes and results. Uh, for example, our organization, IPA, work with government and partners so they can gain important insights into which of their interventions work and don't work and why, and adopt lessons learned from other uh, innovative and, and proven uh, programs. And I have here also some uh, specific uh, examples or of where um, development um, elements of development has an impact that security or, or alone could not have. Uh, a clear examples that come to my mind since we are working on the adaptation of this strategy in Mexico City is uh, Operation Ceasefire. Uh, this is a strategy that started in Boston and is a data-driven violence reduction strategy that coordinates law enforcement, social services, and the community. The major goal of Operation Ceasefire is to reduce uh, grand, uh, gang and group-related homicides and shootings, and it seeks to combine the best of uh, community energy, social services, and strategic law enforcement to reduce gun violence associated with guns uh, uh, far more effective than uh, these enti entities operating alone. Uh, Operation Ceasefire focus on the most violent, violent groups and individuals who are at greatest risks of shooting or being shot. This strategy has an element of direct communication with individuals through group meetings or by one-on-one -on -one, uh, one -on -one -on -one meetings. Ceasefire includes, when necessary, multi-agency law enforcement action, focused specifically on groups and individuals who continue to engage in violence, but it also includes community outreach, services and support such as cognitive behavioral therapy, job placement, health benefits, housing, etc. And I think this is a clear example of uh, a strategy that will not work with only law enforcement policies. And this strategy has been proved very effective, effective in, 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 in other places uh, thanks to this uh, holistic approach, approach to security. Uh, it reduced homicides in Boston by 63%, in Stockton by 42%, in Oakland by 44%, and Chicago by 37%. Another example is the use of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. 
of the node uh, CBT. Since the 80s, CBT has been used in very different contexts, but now is uh, also used to treat uh, criminal and violent behavior. Uh, CBT is designed to make people more aware of their own thoughts and help them understand the consequence of their actions and motivate them to adopt new strategies. Several studies prove that CBT positively impacts criminal justice outcomes. Almost Every effective anti-violence treatment now contains some elements of CBT. Also, CBT appears more effective when combined with other services. For instance, in Chicago, the program uh, Becoming a Man combined sports, youth engagement, positive masculinity training, and CBT. And two separate studies found uh, that after participating in this program, students were 40 to 50 less likely to be arrested for a violent crime. Um, another very recent example is uh, READY that in fact our moderator is evaluating. Uh, READY is a CBT informed employed program that targets men at uh, the highest risk of gun violence involvement. Uh, from the early findings, we know that, um, that men who participate in this program have 79% fewer uh, arrests for shooting and homicides and a large uh, statistical uh, significant difference. Um, so yeah, uh, I think these are the ways how we can uh, combine law enforcement strategy uh, with strategy that also uh, can work for uh, development. So thanks. Great, thanks so much. So um, there's a few questions from the audience. I have a few questions and like, let me try to link the four of you together in some way. And so let me make a prediction. Uh, let's just, you know, let's suppose the next 50 years looks more like Mexico than Ukraine, uh, where we're not going to see a return to great power conflict. And we're not going back to the new wars that I think characterize really weak states. Um, we're, we're, fortunately, we're entering a world of medium strong states, middling states. And that's great. There's a lot and, and, and a certain amount of development. And that's mostly positive. But but what does that mean? Well, one that means so they're, they're, they're strong enough not to worry about insurgencies. Uh, they're strong enough to outlaw certain sectors and groups, and they're wealthy enough for people to afford the illicit goods they sell. Uh, and so, and so, there's going to be state cartel conflict. There's going to be state struggles to control urban gangs, and there's going to be rising uh, homicide levels, especially in cities. And uh, and in some sense, I just described the Americas, this entire hemisphere, in the last uh, 20 years. And the, and the chief security issue that I think basically every president and every mayor, whether it's Chicago or Medellin or Rio, wakes up every morning and worries about. So, and we have this amazing apparatus that, that, that this development, these development institutions and the security peace building apparatus, and are we, suppose the rest of the world starts to look more like the Americas. Are we prepared for that? And what would we have to do differently? And I, I'm, I'm, I think anyone who wants to jump in, I welcome, welcome anyone's responses on that. Well, I think it's very alarming. I mean, I, I tend to think that uh, what's going on in Mexico and Venezuela is more or less a new war. It just doesn't have the political dimensions. It's criminalization and armed gangs. And that's so I think it's perfectly possible to imagine that with this perfect storm we're facing of pandemics, extreme inequalities, um, growing crime, extreme poverty, climate change, much increased climate change disasters, this one scenario is that we do move to if you like a global new war situation, if you think of a new war situation as a sort of social system, then one scenario is that's the way we're going to move. And the question is, what are the countervailing, um, what are the countervailing tendencies? I actually do have a lot of hope in the European Union, <laughs> and I think it represents a new type of polity. And I don't know whether now this change, I mean, the problem up till now has been, I think, the way market fundamentalism has been entrenched into the EU structures. And my hope is that this is changing now. 
partly as a consequence uh, of the pandemic and the new recovery program and the introduction of bonds, and partly in response to what's happening in Ukraine, where the EU has welcomed two million refugees within two weeks, in huge contrast to what it was doing earlier. And I do think the countervailing have to be regional, the countervailing tendencies have to be regional and global and real efforts to address issues like climate change and pandemics on a global basis. And I don't know which, which direction is most likely to win. You may well be right, Chris, but I think it's not just like the Americas now, it would be a lot worse than the Americans now, given the kind of problems that we're going to be facing. Yeah, I just wanted to weigh in a, a, a bit on this really, um, really key question. Uh, absolutely. And I, I, I mean, I just have to, with apologies, just go back to some of my, my key points from before. And I think there's just no way uh, to avoid getting to the root of the problems. We, we, we have to go to the root causes of these different um, uh, origins of, of crisis, uh, conflict, instability, violence, and so forth. Um, and we have to resign ourselves to the fact that there's no quick fixes. Um, sustaining peace, arriving at peace, first of all, or preventing conflict, uh, and certainly sustaining peace is a long-term process. We're, we've been talking about, you know, institutions, institution uh, building, uh, development, stabilization, all of this takes a lot of time. And I have to say, I think in the past, if we want to talk about lessons learned, uh, the international community has often dropped the ball when they have tried to, to be supportive. Um, for example, you know, where we've gone into crisis uh, situations where you have, um, you know, an unconstitutional government. Um, and uh, the first thing that occurs to us is we have to have elections immediately. And we pour a lot of money and effort into getting halfway decent elections. And then we try to use that as the exit strategy. I mean, that never works. We always come back later um, with, with an even worse uh, mess if the, if the, the, the situation, the circumstances are, are, are not right. So I think, again, that's another um, point of peace building that we realize uh, that sustaining peace, it, it just takes a lot of time and investment over time. Um, and it's also not linear. You know, you can have two steps forward and, and three steps uh, back. And and some of your your fixes to to stabilize in the short term the security situation might exacerbate the development situation, um, or or you might have a have a vice versa situation. Um, and I think one of the things we have to look at in these kinds of situations is is what we we call the horizontal inequalities. So um, we, we have to look at different segments of the population. You were alluding to that, Chris, you know, so, some that are better off and can afford um, uh, to, to, to keep up their, um, their, their, their illicit activities. Um, one of the things the UN country teams are trying to do uh, is to um, establish policies and, and uh, frameworks to leave no one behind, as we, as we call it. And I think that will be very important. Otherwise, we, we need to... Partially, that's one of the things we need to look at the fault lines of society and we need to see what we can do to make sure that we're fully bringing in gender, that we're aware of ethnic tensions and cleavages and how to deal with that, that we also address the rural urban divide. I mean, all of this, this can feed into an ongoing um, instability. So I just want to say that we root causes, understanding the drivers of, of conflict, trying to, to strategize and plan on that basis. I think Stefano was talking about, you know, needing um, and also debt, you know, needing to do things in parallel, not not sequentially, because all of that has to come on stream as much as possible as, um, at the um, at the the same time, and we just have to uh, stay the course. There is no quick fix, unfortunately. Thank you. So, uh, Odette, I might, I'd love you to speak to this, but let me let me like put you on the spot in a very specific way, which is to say that you know, I, I moved from working in civil wars in Africa where the UN and multilateral system was a font of ideas and resources and action and policy. And it was in and, and, and a way that in many, often was very functional. And then I began working on criminal violence in Latin America and the role of multilaterals and it, it, for any of those things seemed to sort of disappear. And, but I'm still newish to that. So do you, what do you see from your perspective? Is there, are the multilaterals like a source of ideas and energy and, and resources and, 
and and whatnot, or is that maybe maybe it's not their their place, and 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 the national governments and cities are stepping up? Uh, what what were your thoughts on this? Uh, thank you, Chris. Yeah, of course, collaboration between uh, different actors is uh, crucial to support institution uh, building and, of course, international organization, foreign governments, uh, national and international universities um, are very important to, to, to increase this collaboration. Um, I think the only way uh, to take advantage of existing research is uh, by identifying and incorporating evidence-based strategies that have already shown uh, promise in the past, and in, in, for example, in, in impact evaluations. Um, as your specific questions of uh, how uh, international actors are uh, supporting us, just like uh, I would say, especially the the, the EU embassy is investing uh, a lot of funds. Uh, in these, some of these funds are uh, more related to implement um, uh, programs um, that uh, sometimes might not be uh, based on evidence, but some of them are. I would say it would be more important if if this type of uh, help or funding could be more flexible uh, in order to be able to to find um, evidence based. Uh, strategies and, and generate evidence. Uh, and it's not as simple as to find a project that was successful in other region, country or population and implement the SAC project, since each context, as we know, is very different. Uh, so it is important to consider the local circumstances, the culture, the different institutional arrangement, the level of uh, compromise of the main actors and assessing how robust the original findings are and start with a proof of, of concept, which means evidence obtained from a pilot project and then carefully pursuing additional evidence uh, on when, where, um, why an approach is expected uh, to work and identifying ways to optimize program design and implementation at scale. Uh, so I think like the best way uh, international organizations uh, can help us is uh, yeah to to invest uh, money in, in the generation of um, evidence and yeah I'll just say uh, local governments uh, are being very active uh, now to to work with uh, different organizations to to solve this problem. I would say that. Uh, IPA in Mexico, for example, is a, a key actor uh, with uh, police uh, institutions in in the country, uh, because um, every like every institution that uh, requires or think about evidence-based interventions uh, have request us technical assistance to implement their organized priorities. And uh, one of the main of these priorities is how to improve citizen trust in their corporations. And since through the country, municipal police forces are ranked at or at near the bottom of citizen trust in government institutions. Now, I wanted to intervene uh, for a second on uh, on this reflection on uh, where we are going and the, the new world, etc. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that in the future uh, there will be a commonality of situations. Uh, you were mentioning everywhere will be like uh, the Americas and similar dynamics. I, I have doubt, honestly, because uh, there is an aspect of culture that we have to consider and also an aspect of uh, economic situation and political situation. Uh, the cultural aspect, which uh, um, I put first, uh, for me is very important because uh, culture uh, determines the mindset of people. And uh, if there is, a, and we notice this, a certain uh, type of um, not only culture in the sense of studies, of the people, which is important, but of the population that is important, but also the fundamentals of a single culture in a country, Let's say the culture in Japan is different than the culture in uh, the United States per se, based on the history of uh, the two countries. And that has certainly an impact. The second element that in my view is also important uh, to, to, to see the differences is for example, the economic aspect. 
one element that creates constant tension in every country is uh, the size of the middle class and the perspectives of the middle class. Is if a country is polarized between rich and poor, is obviously going to go south more easily than uh, than other countries. So the here I go back to the idea of development that uh, we were discussing uh, in the previous uh, set of questions. And development is essential because it creates perspectives of improvement in the daily life of uh, families. And so this is an element that stabilizes a country and allows to reduce conflict. And this goes, uh, this has an impact depending on the situation, on the gangs or on guerrilla, more or less is the same uh, logic. The third element that I think it's important to consider is the political aspect. Um, elections are, how can I say, a sacred graal at the moment. No, elections are essential. And I agree with that. But elections that are, uh, um, as Elizabeth was, was saying, uh, put together just to, for the sake of election, in a society that is not ready for election, just to have an excuse to say, okay, it's done, more or less, they had a sort of election uh, problem solved, are actually a source of tension. Because in that moment of the election, all the sides, the sides have uh, to grab the power. And so it can become actually a factor of... Uh, the stabilization of, of the country more than, than anything else. So here, the, the political aspect is important and how we design the process to get to election is important. Um, I've been involved uh, in, uh, in the Balkans uh, when I was uh, younger. And uh, the first element that at the time we addressed, for example, was the uh, commune, so the municipalities, because uh, there you start uh, constructing the small political uh, environment and where there will be different winners. There will be in some areas uh, the black party will be in, in others the red party, in others the yellow party, and so the share of power starts uh, getting together. And uh, so for me, one element that we have also to consider is how the political uh, environment is, sh is shaped in each country because that's also an element that provides uh, stability. If there is a win, uh, one wins all uh, approach, it's always more difficult to maintain stability. And so I would say that the world is different. And so I'm more hopeful that uh, there will be a, a line that goes towards uh, a more inclusive society both in terms of policy and political aspect than economic aspect. But that's a hope. I realize that I'm more naive, probably. <laughs> Thank you. Great, thanks. So um, so one of our audience members asked about the extent to which we should be addressing inequalities, especially group inequalities. And and as one of our one of you already mentioned, I can't remember whom, uh, that this was a main message of the Pathways for Peace document, which was this huge multilateral effort. And so you know, there's an easy answer, right? That just, oh yes, of course we should address inequalities. And um, and let me just, and so, so, but so rather than sort of let you give the easy answer, let me tell you like why recently I've become more skeptical of this. And it came from moving to Chicago. And, and the thing that happens when you move to Chicago and you work for violence, and you work on issues of violence abroad is everybody you meet says, why do you work over there? We have a violence problem here. And, uh, and that's true. And so I began working, I was invited onto a project. I began working on uh, gun violence between armed groups in the city. Uh, and it's, it was enlightening in the following way, because I think, you know, American people who work on this, whether it's the policy and the practitioners, the ex-gang members who do outreach, the American criminologists, I think they've really learned one big thing that has been the cornerstone to the extent that there's ever successful policy in, in armed group violence in U.S. cities. I think the cornerstone, as far as I can tell, is that they say, they look at a city like Chicago and they say it's hugely unequal, like bifurcated, unequal, you know, by all, you know, you know, and, and, and yet um, 
they say, you know, we could try to develop the South side and the West side of Chicago. And we could try to address these historical inequalities that we all know about. And that's important to do for lots of reasons, but that's not going to stop the violence today. The fact is, is there's 3000 people, there's a handful of groups and maybe 3000 people are actually pulling triggers. And our policy to stop violence this year is to sort of focus on those small number of groups and those small number of people while also going about the slow business of inequality. And the frustration that a lot of these policy and practitioners have is that city administrations and national governments get distracted too often by developing the whole South side, developing the whole West side, which is probably not going to benefit those 3000 people. And so it, we have to make hard choices as policymakers. And so focusing on inequalities actually makes it harder to solve violence in U.S. cities. That's that's like if, if I had to characterize the big lesson from countering armed groups in America, that that might be it. And so that's just made me reflect on whether or not, of course, as a global society, we have to address inequalities. And of course, if you go into a place, whether it's Mexico or 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 or, or Central African Republic or whatever, Myanmar, you have to think about inequalities, but maybe it's a distraction from the small number of groups and the small number of people who are actually pulling triggers. And we need to not be distracted and focus on that. So that was a long question, but it's it's like this main thing I've been struggling with for three years. So I'm curious what you have to say. So here I would like to mention an analogy that Professor Thomas Abt shared in his book, Bleeding Out. And this is to imagine that you're a doctor in the ER and a person that has just been shot lights before you and it's bleeding profusely. Uh, this person is wearing old and dirty clothes and he might be jobless, homeless and without other sense of education. Could you start uh, treating him by funding him a job or locating, locating an apartment or enrolling him to school? Or should, you, or should you take the only sensible course of action available at the time? That is first, stop the bleeding because unless you stop the bleeding, nothing else matters. So I think this analogy illustrates what um, um, our moderator is uh, telling us. So we have to identify the outcomes we want and quantify the impact over those specific outcomes. Do you want to reduce inequality uh, or do you want to reduce violence in the short term? Um, I'm wondering if there really is such a trade-off. I think what my concern is looking at it not from an American perspective is that what we've seen over the last few years is the growth of the phenomenon of the populist right. And of course, it does affect America too, because it's the Trump phenomenon. And I think what you see, the characteristics of the populist right are the characteristics that those of us who have been working on conflicts, whether it's in the Balkans, whether it's in Syria, are quite familiar with. And I think one aspect is what I tend to call crony capitalism, what my colleague Alex DeWall calls the political marketplace, where you have a sort of contracting out culture of the state, where more and more functions are contracted out, and in particular where you have a state that depends not so much on taxation from productive activities, but on rent or on taxation from the financial sector. Um, you have a group of what you might call oligarchs, people who get incredibly rich uh, through working for the state. And that phenomenon is very much linked to either ethnic nationalism or racism. The, those oligarchs frame their desperation to stay in power in terms of racist or ethnic terms. And they also tend to emphasize what they call family values that are usually homophobic and misogynist. And, you know, I think actually it's dealing with that political phenomenon that certainly is at the root of trying to deal with violence on a large scale. I don't know how it affects very specific conditions of criminal violence in, in Chicago. But what I would say is it's the phenomenon we see in Putin. It's the phenomenon we see in Trump. Uh, and it involves a huge loss of legit legitimacy for public authority. 
um, an acceptance that you can lie. Um, and it, it, in a way, legitimizes, I think, violence at local levels. Uh, I don't know, some people talk about regressive behavior. You know, the, one of the reasons that you tend to like people like Trump or Putin is because you long to lie and behave badly yourself. So I think actually there's a big political task for us ahead of us if we really want to address violence. And inequality is part of that because it is really grotesque if you look at the fortunes that have been made during the era of globalization at a time of extreme poverty and the ways in which that has been accelerated during the last two years of the pandemics. In the UK at the moment, we're having a big discussion about whether we should increase national insurance, which Labour is against because there's a cost of living crisis, but nobody dares talk about how to tax these hugely well, wealthy people who are really at the source of some of the problems that we're facing. Um, okay, uh, thanks. I'm going to go back a little bit to my, my other point, but also build on what Mary was um, saying. I, I don't think, and I would like not to believe that there's necessarily a trade-off between the two things that you're, you're talking about, and certainly not if you're looking at, you know, let's say, fixing the problem in a, in a durable way. And I realize, you know, I'm I'm not naive. You were saying you might think you're a bit naive, but um, I'm not naive about the role of politicians and the way that um, they usually look at these sorts of issues. Um, they are looking at what is going to get them reelected next year or in six months or in two years or, or three years. And there will always be that tension, I think, between the short termism of trying to show quick gains and um, trying really to build on something that is actually going to last and going to change things. But I, I think we, we can't give up on that. We have to get better at trying to, um, to ensure that you have the right policies and that, and that these policies can stay the course. And I can tell you that in terms of the work that we've been doing in peace building in, in different um, country and regional contexts, whether it um, has to do with dealing or helping countries to deal with gang violence or reintegration of ex-combatants and, and so forth, it has been critical that you also bring in from the get-go this is issue of livelihoods, at least some distributive uh, policies. That's been key. If you're just looking at how do you, you know, absolutely stop them, take away their guns, and and get them to stop shooting, um, it's usually very fragile. I think there again, there's we 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 can't do this entirely sequentially. I, I frankly don't think it will work. And and um, Odette was talking about you know evidence uh, evidence based uh, policies, and I think we need to look at the evidence. I, I don't see many quick fixes, frankly, working in the in the in the longer term. And I would also pick up on Mary's point with respect to um, to trust. I think part of the element that um, we maybe don't work on enough is supporting uh, the local authorities and the communities in building the the basic modem, modicum of trust. Uh, between them, so that these people are having some sort of trust that they can they can um, actually be part of these sorts of um, of programs, and part of that will will I think have to include again having a more inclusive and diverse uh, set of of of, of uh, security forces, so a, a police that resembles um, physically and culturally. Um, Stefano was talking about culture, the uh, the communities in which they're serving. I think that could also go a long way. But again, I would really caution against, you know, just saying, well, we 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 have to fix this problem in in, in six months, and let's just concentrate on the guns, and um, we don't have time for the 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 other the other things. Those aren't optional extras; they aren't freely add-ons. I don't see how you're going to be successful unless you also look at um, where are these people going to go, what are what are these people going to do. Um, often, you 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 stick these young offenders in jail. And uh, they they basically go to the best criminal school uh, in 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 the country when you, when you put them in some of these penal institutions, especially when they're very very young and and first time offenders. So um, again, I just uh, I'm perhaps a bit repetitive on that point, but I really um, would caution against sort of shedding some of these things as if they were optional extras um, and just going for the um, the quick fix. Thank you.
Let me let me just ask on that because it relates. So maybe Stefano, I'm not going to change the topic. I'm going to deepen it and then maybe ask for your thoughts because it has a lot to do with what you spoke about with just this comprehensive approach to to, to peace building and, and to security. And um, and here's partly where let me let me make it like just a concrete example. I, I spent many years working in Liberia in the years after the war, um, and and this was at a for for what was an extremely in some sense weak state apparatus it was a it was an incredibly in some ways admirable and well run state apparatus coming from where it did uh and yet they started with here like, like just empty capacity and had to very slowly build it up um they fortunately had like i think a, a terrific series of public servants in charge and they had a a, a really strong um un peace building mission and set of international partners. So, so despite its incredibly weak starting point, had, had all the advantages. And yet, my reflecting back on those years, my, my worry is that that government was asked to do everything. They were asked to be comp, they were asked to address gender and jobs and power and roads and this and that. I could just go on, right? They were given this policy agenda to implement that was that was comprehensive. And and sometimes when everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. And this is true everywhere. I think, you know, any good president or prime minister of the most developed and high capacity state comes into office. And I think if they're savvy, they know I can do one, two, maybe three things this year, maximum. And if I put all my energy on those things, I can do them. And, and so my worry is that the comprehensive approach is actually this politically necessary thing that international organizations have to do because they have to sort of tell everyone, oh, yes, we, we care about gender and you care about climate, we care about this, we care about... But at the end of the day, you're facing a president in a very weak country that's teetering on the brink of going back to violence and they have to make hard choices about what they're going to do this year because they can accomplish three things. And so, so how, do you, like, how do you deal with those? We all know this to be true, I think. So how do we deal with those trade-offs and this tension between the comprehensive approach and what's politically possible? I start given that you are uh, pointing at me, but I think it's uh, actually my reply is the integrated approach to, to your problem. <laughs> and I try to explain why. Um, there is no quick fix to stabilize a, a country in a crisis. And I think uh, Elizabeth was saying this uh, before. So unfortunately for that uh, president, uh, he cannot say I can do two things which are, one are uh, relevant. He will have or she will have to, to look at uh, the most urgent and the others, maybe. But he has to work on different strands all, of, all at one time. Uh, the first thing I, uh, that is important is to see if that president is representing the whole society or if he's a president that got, just got uh, up there through a coup d'etat, supported by a specific uh, part of the society. That's already changes the picture. Let's suppose that he's a president elected by everybody and there is a process, then in the case he has to give a, a direction. And there you have to do very simple thing. First of all, feed the population, because uh, an empty belly is the best way to have uh, a violent society. So, for example, humanitarian. And here we play one aspect of the integrated approach, the comprehensive approach. The humanitarian aid is essential at the beginning. So that's what some, something that can be done. And that president should ensure that the humanitarian aid is distributed at all uh, parts of the society. Not that, for example, someone gets it and others are out of it. So that's already something that that president could decide now in one second. The second element is to give a perspective to those that have the guns. Because uh, DDR is a process that takes time, but the first element is to take the gun out of the hands of, for example, children that are used uh, as uh, killers. Um, as I said, I have a few experience in this uh, area. Uh, and DDR processes need to be tailor-made for a situation. When I was uh, in Bosnia, 
the element that gave uh, a push to DDR was a political track, to have a political solution. When I was dealing with the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, it was uh, rice, cows, food, elements like this. Uh, we are now dealing in Africa with the DDR process that I cannot uh, mention where. And in that situation, for example, is the safety of the family because the combatants are combating with the family and they want to be sure that them and their families and children, they can find the relocation in a place where they can start a new life. So, you see, you have to address the situations according uh, to needs. And um, the other element that I would say is uh, that the integrated approach becomes essential because uh, in uh, ensuring the security of that society that you are describing, you need, for example, to have a provider, an impartial provider of security, a military presence or a police presence that ensures that uh, the international community can keep an eye on what's going on on the ground. That's for also something that uh, we have to look at it. As you hinted, development, for example, economic recovery will take a few years before uh, being concrete, but that's uh, part of the game. And that's why also uh, our interventions in country should not be seen as intervention that last six months, but they have to see as intervention that have to go on the long uh, run. I don't believe in those that uh, consider a deployment, uh, for example, of a military force uh, six months, and then the problem is fixed. To rebuild a society that is ruined by a war, you need uh, to look in uh, decennies, in my view. So, well, th let me, I just want to make sure we get, there's a couple of other questions and, and there's a there's a great one that I think is related to this. So it takes us on this theme. So I think we can, we can everyone can, can still jump in. And, and I think it, it relates to this theme of trade-offs and hard choices. And, and one of the audience members said, um, essentially, I think said, you know, okay, so tell us what we shouldn't do. Right. So, yes, we have to be comprehensive. So suppose, you know, Stefano, you've, you've, you've persuaded everyone. We've all persuaded. But but still, there are trade-offs. And so what should we do less of uh, as a result of what we've learned from the last 20 years? And and we do just have about six or seven minutes left. So I'll just ask. So so, so the, not all of us may be able to speak. But but if, if, if you could just be each be brief, then we might we might get through most of us. Please, Elizabeth. Okay, uh, just a couple of things um, based on the the last uh, question and um, and also the, the one before. I mean, what can what can we do less of? Maybe we have to, and, and this has been a light motive, I think, for, uh, in in the discussion today. Or certainly, I've tried to bring it to the fore. We maybe need to fixate less on on the central government. It's important to have a strong central government and state building. We often focus on those federal or whatever the arrangement is institutions. Um, and we know that part of the problem of conflict affected, many conflict affected and fragile uh, countries is indeed that um, the central state has no presence in, um, in, in much of the country. So I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive to that. But again, going back to local peace building and what can be done at the community level as well, because again, states and institutions also need to uh, um, exist and, and be strengthened at the, at the community level. And maybe we need to invest more in, in that. So for example, um, so I'm not saying do less state building at the state level necessarily, but not make that the, um, the, the only focus. And perhaps there is a bit of a trade-off there because uh, let's say in terms of conflict resolution and so forth, even development approaches, there are a lot of local already practices that could be simply built upon. And Stefana, you were talking a bit again about the cultural dimension, instead of trying to impose some new ideas on how things can be done in some of these local communities, we need to just build on the good traditional practices that already um, exist. And in terms of, you know, well, we have to make a trade-off because how can you also, you know, take care of gender and also do development and do security and so forth. I mean, obviously we need to be there to support. Um, uh, and, and, and I think also we, not make, we need to not make this look as if it's absolutely um, un undoable. So what, what is the, the difficulty? Uh, I don't want to make it sound super easy, but okay, of having a more gender responsive development uh, policy. In other words, um, making sure and, and, and helping those, those governments to make sure that women who in these conflict-affected areas usually make up 
well over 50% of the population, that their specific concerns are understood and that they're able to participate. I mean, that's a key plank for us in terms of inclusion. And it just makes common sense. So if they're they're too busy or they can't spare the energy for that, then it, honestly, I mean, what are they going to develop? What are they going to be able to do? Um, so I, I think, and and if you said that you mentioned the Liberia case, and I think this issue of a big focus on state building, primarily at the top, might have been one of the challenges. And thirdly, I just want to mention that again, with respect to staying the course, one of the things that we're trying to really focus on at the UN in terms of peace building is transition. So. You, you do often have at least um, some pretty consistent support with these peace operations, plus the UN country teams on the ground and other actors. And then when the big peace mission goes, there's this financial cliff, there's not the same amount of money. Um, and now all of a sudden the governments are, are, are expected to carry on with much less support. That's one of the things we're trying to address to make sure that there is that continuity because again, you know, Rome was not built in a day and peace is not built in a day. Thank you. Would you like me to go next? Great. I think the first thing to say is that the only people who can really make peace are the people who are on the ground. Um, and also I want to make the point that people on the ground are usually have a much better understanding of their situation than people who come from outside. And the people on the ground aren't necessarily poor traditional people. You know, people always go on about tradition in Afghanistan, whereas this is a country where two thirds of the population had been displaced, where they'd watched television in India, Pakistan. So people are often a lot more sophisticated <laughs> than we assume. So that's the first point I want to make, that people on the ground understand things. The second point I want to make is that there's an element of what people call what I call civicness. I don't call it civil society because civil society tends to mean NGOs and organized groups. What I mean is civicness could be a local authority that really is trying to provide public services for its people, but it could be honest civil servants. It could be honest doctors who want to treat anybody regardless of their ethnicity. It could be teachers who are passionately committed to education. And it could be activists as well, and, and it very often is women. It could be neighbours who are helping each other. And actually, in conflict zones, none of this would survive without civicness. And there's a tendency in the international community to assume the people you need to talk to to end the violence are the armed groups and the politicians. And I suppose my main argument was would be actually you need to focus on the civic element and you need to talk to those people and get an idea of how you should deal with the armed group and politicians for them. So I sort of think my recipe for peace building, and when Elizabeth talks about local peace building, I think you very often get more civicness at local levels because local levels are closer to the citizens. But you can also get very nasty, vicious, horrible groups. And often the local level requires a civic ally, either at the international level or at the national level. Actually, we've been doing some studies of civicness and, and we do find that civicness it is the encounter with the civic international. And I'm not necessarily talking about the UN. I'm talking about examples we've found from patients who all went to Kurdish hospitals, which were run on the basis of various that, that got funding in exchange for non-discriminatory standards. I'm talking about a journalist in Iraq who tried to expose corruption but was only able to do it through uh, through uh, alliance with uh, the Guardian newspapers and the Panama Papers, which provided him with a certain degree of protection. I can go on giving you those kinds of examples, but my point really is let's I think we should focus on civicness and deal with the bad elements, the crony capitalism, the racism, the ethnic nationalism, through the eyes of people on the ground who are trying to end their wounds. Great. Well, I am sad to say we are out of time, time. and so uh, I'm just going to close it out here, thanking our audience, uh, most of all thanking our panelists, uh, and wishing everyone a very good morning, afternoon, or evening. Thank you. Thank you.